Jessica Morehouse here. I recently did my second Millennial Money Meetup event and it was awesome. It was a smash success, sold out tickets in five days, and we had a ton of people show up for the live event and tune in to the live stream on Facebook. But in case you weren't able to attend in person or you missed the live stream, that's okay. That's why I made sure to record the whole event so you can join in the fun, learn more about housing, mortgages, and the steps you need to take in order to buy your first home. But first, before I get to that recording, uh, I want to say a big thank you to the event sponsor, Meridian Credit. Union. Without these guys, this event wouldn't have been possible. So a big thank you to Meridian. If you are currently looking for a new financial institution or want more information about mortgages, especially their new uh, family and friends mortgage, make sure to go to meridiancu.ca. We um, are really excited to support Jessica in helping to educate millennials. Meridian is a credit union, which is a financial cooperative. So we work closely with our members to help them achieve their goals. We also um, work closely with our communities and we like to partner and um, have community events as well as partnerships like this that we can support and help um, you know, educate you guys. We offer a great range of products, everything from your daily checking account, and we offer a great package for individuals up to the age of 29. We offer free banking. So if anyone fits the bill, make sure to come and check us out. And we also have great rates on mortgages. And we've introduced our family and friends mortgage, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more tonight um, to help some of you get in the market. We know it's a challenging time right now. Um, you know, so much stuff is going on in the media, you don't know what to, Everything you read is, you know, there's something different. Um, so yeah, so we're excited to help you work through that. And um, lastly, make sure if you haven't already, check out our table at the back to enter our contest for a $500 HomeSense gift card. Awesome, okay. Well, uh, to start, I'm gonna introduce my lovely uh, panelists. First beside me, I've got Jelani Smith. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Jelani is a finance guru, guru with a passion for real estate. Uh, he's currently finishing his final semester at U of T and is earning his bachelor's in business administration. He currently works at BMO Financial Group and he also founded the Bay Street Blog, a millennial finance hub. And also, he recently bought his first home in Toronto. Congratulations! <laughs> uh, and second down the road, we've got Heather O'Hare. She's a mobile, mobile mortgage specialist from Meridian. She has over 10 years of mortgage experience and she loves working with first. First time home buyers. She also volunteers with the Canadian Cooperative Association, Ontario Cooperative Association, and Dress for Success. Thanks so much for joining us, Heather. Thanks, Jessica. All right, and I've got Penelope Graham. Thanks so much for joining us. She is the managing editor of Zucasa.com. She's a born and bred Torontonian. She's a quintessential millennial and she has over a decade of experience uh, covering real estate, lifestyle, and personal finance. And she's also provided commentary on housing and mortgages on BNN, CTV, and CBC. Welcome. Great to be here. And last but not least, we've got Leslie Gaynor. She is a business and community leader in Toronto with over 20 years of experience building Mitzi's restaurants. Uh, her passion for real estate comes from a joy in helping people thrive. Real, she's a real estate, oops, sorry, real estate sales rep with Royal Lepage, and she's also the owner owner of GoCo Solutions, which specializes in cooperative purchasing in Toronto. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, so this uh, event is focused on housing, real estate, uh, purchasing your first home. Uh, it is a very hot topic, that's why I thought it was a very good idea to do an event on this topic because uh, a lot of us want to own but don't know if we can afford to own or they, you want to know what steps to take. So that's kind of the first uh, you know, uh, thing that we're going to talk about. What are the first steps you should take in order to become you know, a first time home buyer? I think a lot of people don't know what the process is. So, uh, who wants to jump in? Anyone want to kind of start us off? Well, you first, John, you, you bought your own home and you're very young. <laughs> I would love to know what steps did you first take to, to get into this? Because it, it is a big purchase, it's a big investment. Definitely. 
So I see the first step I took was adjusting my expectations. So I did a uh, specific budget up to um, how much home I can afford. And from there, looking at which areas would, like how much house I can get in each yeah. area. So for example, in um, Toronto East, for about 600000 well, this is at uh, January 2016, so prices were a bit cheaper. Right, yeah. But uh, <laughs> for about 600000 it will get you a nice free whole townhouse. Whereas if I go out to the suburbs, maybe Ajax, Brampton, mm -hmm. it will give me a detached home. So it's all about adjusting expectations and um, to avoid like, the big surprises and knowing what you can get with your money. Mm -hmm. And so where in Toronto did you buy? And, and was that a decision because you could afford, more, like it just made more sense with your budget? So I bought a townhouse in Scarborough, mm -hmm. um, Toronto East End. Um, the main reason why I bought there instead of a suburban detached home is because I don't need that much space for myself. Right. And also, it's cheaper to commute from the east end of Toronto rather than coming in from the suburbs where the gold is much more expensive. And also, the Toronto's property taxes are the lowest in Ontario. Mm. So I'll be saving on those uh, costs as well. Yeah, sounds like you made a wise decision. You did your research. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, <laughs> um, I think like what Jelani said is be realistic, set your expectations, and this is your first home. You don't have to buy, you know, the big mansion. This is your first home to get in the market. Um, I always recommend first to speak to a mortgage specialist and try and do it as early as possible, even when that's you know just a thought in your head that you're thinking of buying. You can come in, we can sit down, do a pre-approval, look at your situation. I can you know, help you work on your budget, how to save your down payment, as well as looking at your credit report, if there's any issues on there. The earlier you come in and we can get those looked after, the better it will be, rather than have a surprise when uh, you know, you're putting an offer. Mm -hmm. Can I help you? And just to add to uh, what has been said so far, um, when you're creating your savings plan for your home purchase, you don't have to do it alone. I highly recommend connecting with a financial advisor to help you set a timeline. Um, so that's what I did with my partner when we bought our condo. And uh, he actually set up TFSAs. So we had automatic payments come out of our, our paychecks. It was in an account that we could not access online with the rest of our other money. So it was out of sight and out of mind. And it really put a tangible context around when we knew that we would be able to buy. We had a two-year timeline. We knew what we would be working with at that point. And that really helped narrow down and set our expectations. And we, we knew what kind of housing stock we were looking at. Well, I'm not a millennial. Uh, <laughs> just complete on that one first. Uh, but I do think that the expectation is a really big one. I think what we set our sights on and what we can afford obviously don't always match. But I also think we need to think about other things about what we want in our life. And because I believe strongly in community and, and, and you know trying to pool resources and maybe uh, my recommendation would be is to see whether or not there's someone else who wants to buy a house too and pool your resources. But I do believe that expectations and looking at the report and finding a really, really solid financial advisor is for sure. As an agent, of course, I want you to be out looking, but I think those are really good pieces to have in place before you start. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, the next kind of thing I'm going to want to talk about is budget. So uh, I think a lot of people get confused or, or just like, you know, they think it's really complicated how to figure out your budget. Um, you can go to a mortgage broker or a mortgage specialist and they'll give you a number, but that may not necessarily work for you. So what are some of your tips and tricks? What are your suggestions on how people should determine what their actual budget is? Would like to go <laughs> I can feel this one. I think it really comes down to the age old rent or buy um, uh, question. So when you're determining if buying a home makes financial sense for you, you should be looking at your, your monthly carrying costs. Um, so whether if you're paying rent and utilities or if you're paying a mortgage with condo fees, what can you actually carry with your salary? Um, and that should be your first step in determining what your home buying budget is. What can you actually carry month to month? How much financial wiggle room will you have? And if you overextend yourself, you know, what kind of financial vulnerability are you putting yourself in? Whether it's you're borrowing too much or you're taking on too much and becoming house poor. And just to add on that, one of my tips is, you know, again, come in, we'll sit down and I'll help you decide um, what your mortgage payment will be, what those carrying costs will be, you'll have property taxes, maybe condo fees, utilities, insurance. You really want to make sure you also have enough to save for a home emergency fund. So my biggest tip for first-time buyers is once we come up with what that number is going to look like, 
compare that to your current rent and start saving that amount. So if it's an extra thousand or fifteen hundred dollars a month, make sure you can save that comfortably. And if you can't, then clearly when you buy a home, you're going to run into problems. And also adding on to that, you may want to look at your current spending habits. So, for example, if you're spending, uh, if you have a home that has, has 10 gigabytes, do you actually need 10 gigabytes? You can look, in, uh, look, look into cutting it down to 5 gigabytes so you can save that amount of money. Mm -hmm. And that's just one example. You could just look into the different spending habits and see where you can save money in order to uh, save a quicker down game. Absolutely. I mean, I just a word of caution on that too. I listen to lots of partnerships and lots of relationships in the back seat of the car going, if we just don't go out for dinner anymore, <laughs> if we don't go on holiday, and if we don't blah blah blah, and I turn to them and say, look, I don't I don't know if that's really the most realistic approach to this. <laughs> We've all become accustomed to a certain amount of commercialization and consumerism, and until we're really willing to give up, I don't know if giving it up at the same time as a reason to purchase your house is going to work over the long haul. And then the only other thing I uh, have seen it happen once where you know, we all believe that we're uh, going to live forever and be healthy is to have protection for unemployment, for yes. times where you can't generate revenue. And that could, that could be a health issue, so having some sort of plan if you lose your income that you're not you know, within 30 seconds of losing your house. So for me that's a big piece. Mm -hmm. Or switching careers, which I did <laughs> six months after buying my place. So, yeah, I think it's it's important for sure, especially as a kind of a new home buyer myself. Uh, really, you know, really looking at the budget and also, yeah, figuring out like we bought a place that didn't really change our lifestyle. We've changed a little bit. We eat more at home and don't eat out as much more. But that was something that was easy to integrate in our lives. So you really and also we're happy to do it because we're really happy being a homeowner instead of renting. So yeah, I think being, you know, setting a realistic budget is yes. always very key. That's the key word, realistic, isn't it? <laughs> um, I want to talk specifically about house hunting. Now, I personally have done a ton of house hunting. We started looking for a place two years ago, and it was craziness because we were trying to find a house, and it was just not within our budget, we realized. It took kind of, you know, a couple years break, and then did it again. We learned a lot of things along the way. So I would especially love to know your opinion on this. What are some things that people need to know before going house hunting? I think a lot of people just jump in, watch house hunters, and think they know it all. <laughs> well, you, the whole, I mean, as it stands right now, one of your most important relationships is with the person who's helping you do that. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't have to be necessarily a sales representative. Right. Um, you can do things private, you can do it through lawyers, but I think you have to have an essential trust in that person that's helping you with the biggest purchase that you're gonna make probably, mm -hmm. unless you're buying something else as well, but that's a pretty big purchase. So I think it's about developing a rapport so you can ask any questions, you can get all the information that you need, that the person encourages you to go seek out all kinds of advice from financial, mortgage, insurance, all kinds of things. And again, it, it's, it's a long process. Um, it's longer now, in fact, because you lose out on so many bidding wars, right. and it's about having the you know, can you keep up with it? You have to be fast and nimble, um, but you also have to have some patience and have to be able to do it over the long haul. So I've been working with clients for, you know, a year or more, wow. and we're still looking. So wow. it's, it's an interesting, quick and not quick mm -hmm. endeavor. And just to add to what Leslie said, a lot of feedback that I get from our in-house agents um, some of the most difficult situations are when their clients are very emotional and they're very frustrated because this is a difficult market to maneuver in, especially if you don't have a lot of, of equity or, or a big down payment. Um, so, it, you know, working with somebody that you do have that trust in, uh, who is able to keep your needs um, as well as your financial ceiling in mind, it is so easy in a bidding work. To lose sight of what you can actually afford and before you know it you are over um, you're strapped for cash uh, month to month you've become house poor you don't have that budget to go out for dinner anymore um, and you're, you're vulnerable should interest rates go up or if there's an economic downturn so it's it's very difficult but take the, the emotion out of your house hunt and keep the numbers first and foremost I think it's really hard to do when you're house hunting, not being emotional with it. And right? I mean, that's that's the role of a very good sales representative. Say, what is your top dollar? And you don't let them, you don't go above that. Mm -hmm. You go in with your top dollar. You might lose them first round, mm -hmm. but you go in with your best foot forward. Mm -hmm. And then you just say, okay, well, it'll be the next one or the next one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I, I'd be curious, how, how long did it take you? What was your house hunting experience? So <laughs> I've been looking since um, like I started working back in high school. So oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so it was about three years of house hunting. Oh, wow. Like, on, like consistently or on and off? That's more like on and off. Like in my spare time, I'll check out new developments, open houses. Um, I actually bought a call in July 2013. Mm -hmm. But I canceled the purchase because um, I never wanted to save up for freehold um, channels. Right. So I just had to just continue saving up for that, and uh, that's why I went for that as well. All right. Okay. And also to add on to, into that, yeah. um, for those who are house hunting, yes. it's important to work with a real estate agent yeah. because they have a good understanding of the area. And they can also look into how much the past homes are sold. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you look at the property that was uh, severely underlisted, you don't want to give an offer that's way over the market value. So that's where the real estate is in terms of house hunting as well. Absolutely. And yeah, one thing that Leslie said that really, I'm like, yeah, that's definitely my experience is you need to really um, find an agent if you're working with an agent that uh, gets you and really understands what you're looking for. And uh, I think that is kind of the, the golden ticket is finding someone who really understands what you want or sometimes knows what you want more than you know. <laughs> I mean, you it should interview them. Yes, absolutely. And, and people just think yeah. this is it's like you just, you know, someone right, oh, you should use my cousin because my cousin is blah, blah, blah. And then you get into that relationship. Interview people. Mm -hmm. You don't have to accept that. You can say, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to interview other people. Thanks. Exactly. And you might, I might get a call back. Mm -hmm. But you only do that if you allow people to actually ask you questions and then they get to think about it. Absolutely. Um, I want to kind of talk about some home ownership misconceptions. So what are, what are some common misconceptions about buying a home or becoming a homeowner that some people may not be aware of? Well, as a first-time home buyer within the past year and a half, um, one of the biggest shocks for us was going from renting where the landlord is responsible for any repairs mm -hmm. uh, to when our sink broke for the first time. And we were on the phone calling plumbers and comparing prices for those repairs uh, and realizing, okay, you know, we really do need to have a fund set aside, a rainy day fund. Um, and it's a cost that you, you know, in the excitement of buying your first home, you don't really realize you are fully responsible for the maintenance of that home. Um, you know, whether it's uh, winterizing your, your balcony or making sure your walls are painted, that's all on you now. Yeah. <laughs> One tip I have, and this is almost sort of even before you get to the home ownership point, um, understanding the difference between pre-qualification and pre-approval on a mortgage. Okay. Pre-qualification, you know, there's every website you can go on, you put in your information, and it's going to spit a number out at you. Don't take that number to heart. Make sure you go in, you speak to your mortgage specialist, bring in your income documentation, <coughs> um, bring in, you know, confirmation of what your down payment. Lots of people will tell me what they think their income is and then they give me their pay slips and their NOAs and it's not quite as high as they would like to think. Um, so, you know, it's sort of the old garbage in, garbage out. If you're putting in information, you know, you're, you're doing it to the best of your ability, um, but as a specialist, I can actually get you that pre-approval and let you know what we would actually qualify you for. That being said, it's still important um, to note that a pre-approval is conditional on a satisfactory appraisal of that property. So that's again where you have your trusted team, you're working with your sales rep who has done their research to know what is that property worth. You know, we've talked about bidding wars and being properties being listed for low, so you know you're going to have to go in higher, but you need someone to be able to help you out and determine what is higher. And what is a reasonable amount? Because if we get an appraisal back and you've overpaid, you know, there's you're still on the hook for that, assuming you didn't put in a condition. You hope your allowance just went up a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> the difference. Yeah. One thing that I've learned as a new home buyer is uh, Penelope was talking about kind of the emergency uh, fund for your home. Well, we bought a townhouse that's about 12 years old and. FYI, that is the date when everything starts to break. So if you're buying a place that's 12 years old and everything's, uh, you know, original to the home, you better have an emergency fund to start slowly replacing everything in your home. 
So, or like in my situation when after we bought, we moved to the kitchen island and discovered that there was a patch of red wood and a sea of blonde hardwood. Oh, goodness. So make sure when you're viewing a home, move everything. See yeah, it moves. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a really good idea too. So when we were house hunting too, I think we got better at house hunting the more we did it. Don't be afraid to touch things or, I mean, ask permission, obviously, but, you know, you really want to know the ins and outs of that home before you're like, yes, here's all my money, um, because you don't want to discover a big, unpleasant surprise after you put your down payment and it's a done deal. Try the switches and turn on the water. Yes, always, yeah. yeah, I always do that. <laughs> um, so I wanted to kind of talk about... You know, a, a big problem is, you know, people being house poor. I know there's something in the news recently that um, there's a poll that, you know, most Canadians or high percentage of uh, Canadians don't feel comfortable if mortgage rates were to go up by 1%, which is scary because 1% is very likely um, mortgage rates are going to go up eventually. So I, I would love, you know, your idea on what are some ways that people can avoid becoming house poor or, or you know, getting caught up in everything and spending more than they really should have. Um, you know, when looking at their realistic budget. I'll say uh, don't buy too much home. Uh, if the bank say uh, you're pre-approved for up to $800,000, it doesn't mean you have to spend that $800,000. Maybe go to do something that's six hundred or 700000 Just give yourself some room in case some interest rates are to rise or if you lost some of your income. So, um, yeah, just don't buy too much house. Mm -hmm. Which can be hard to do, especially when you, you know, you make a certain amount of money and then you're told, oh, this is how much you can get. It's like, oh, maybe I'm richer than I think. Not necessarily. <laughs> I, I personally, like, try to kind of still maintain your lifestyle. Don't, you know, be like, this is finally, now I can finally afford my dream home. It is a loan. You're going to have to pay it back. Let's not forget. <laughs> it's not free money. <laughs> And interest rates are at record lows right now. You know, we've enjoyed that for probably close to about seven years. You know, a lot of people who are buying their homes for the first time don't know a reality where interest rates are not this low. Um, people who you made, looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> people who bought homes in the 80s know that it can be a very different reality. Um, so if, if you are reliant on interest rates being as low as they are right now uh, to afford your home, you can't afford that home. Um, so a good word of advice is always to build in some padding, you know, 1 to 1 1.5% just in case rates do rise. Um, you know, the Bank of Canada is saying that it, it's not likely until 2018. Well, if you've, if you've just locked into a five-year mortgage, you might avoid that, but what happens when it's renewal time? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I really believe that there are other ways to purchase property. That's why I think cooperative purchasing or pooling resources really makes some sense. Uh, I bought my first house when I was 25 uh, with a friend. Um, we split it 50-50. We had a legal agreement. I've learned a lot since then. Uh, I've helped numerous people buy cooperatively, set up good legal agreements, and in fact their cash flow has improved for other reasons, not just because of property purchasing, but they've also found other ways to save money. So um, some uh, will share childcare, um, some dog walking. Um, one family's gone down to one car instead of two cars. They have one vehicle and they share it. They're sharing the insurance, the gas, the whole nine yards. So their cash flow is actually not, it's not necessarily improved from a mortgage perspective, but it's freed up from other things. Um, so it, it's, it's not really that new an idea. It's an idea that people have been doing for a very long time. It's just that when banks like Meridian uh, and sales representatives start talking differently about it, then people can go, oh, oh right. So I just, I just want to add yeah. that as that part is, of It's not part you of just have to buy a house alone, which is kind of the traditional exactly. way of thinking. It's exactly. like finally you can buy your own home with your right. right big effect. And gentle yeah. density. I mean, the, you know, all the planners are talking about gentle density, and especially in a city like Toronto where you have a lot of density in areas that are very poorly serviced for that amount of population that's there, whether that be simple grocery shopping or green markets like green grocers. But, you know, they're really encouraging I mean, we're often overhoused. I mean, if you look at other parts of the world, really, and, you know, you buy a flat in London, England, you buy, you don't buy a whole house often. And here it's like we have this need to have more house. Yeah. Then we actually, actually, not can we afford it, we actually don't even need it, like, yeah. you know. So it, it is a, it's a creative, you know, way to get into the market. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to talk a bit more about mortgages. This was uh, something that I had no idea about before I, you know, uh, 
first started talking to my husband about buying our first place, uh, and it seemed a little scary and complicated. So uh, I know a lot more now, well, probably more than I need to know, but I would love to uh, get your thoughts on what are some of the key things that people need to know uh, about mortgages and what are people, what should people do in order to make sure they get the best mortgage rate, which I think is the key thing to look out for is getting the lowest rate possible so you can pay the least amount of money. Mm -hmm. I'll start with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things I always say to people is credit is king. You really need to know what your credit score is and understand what goes into it. Because uh, the higher your score, that's where you have the most negotiating power and getting the best rate. Um, so that being said, it's also important to know rates aren't everything. Obviously, you want to get a great rate, but you want to also make sure you're comparing apples to apples. So when you're looking at different institutions and you're comparing the rates, also understand what fees, what penalties you might have if you have to break your mortgage. Um, you know, is there, yeah, is there any hidden costs that actually become, it, it increased your interest rate, but that's not the rate they're telling you. So understand that you're comparing things, all the features, the prepayment privileges and things like that. Um, so you can make an educated decision that, you know, point one or point two might seem like a better deal, but then when you look at what fees you might have on renewal or an application fee that are hidden in, those are actually making up for it. And add on to that, um, don't, make sure you don't go to uh, like more than three or four lenders to, um, to get to like mortgage application. It's not actually damages your credit score because they'll still see it as a credit seeker. So um, I recommend you to do your research beforehand, see who offers the best mortgage rates, who has, um, uh, who has like, the least penalties or things like that, then do your application from there. But try to limit it as much as you can. Just to add on to what Jelani said, if you work with a, a broker, they can help you avoid that because they'll do one master poll and then they'll utilize that for a number of lenders. Um, I just wanted to point out that in Canada, the banking landscape here is somewhat unique. It's very different from the U.S. in that the branding for the big five banks is absolutely enormous. Um, they're household names, and in Canada, what's called bank bias is, is very big. So I've met people who haven't realized that they can get banking products from banks that are not their home bank. Oh, you mean I can get a credit card from BMO when I bank at TD? You know, like it, it's more common than you think. Um, so it's really important as a mortgage shopper to know that you have options, whether it's at a big bank or a small lender or you know credit union. Um, and it's important, you know, working with a broker is really fabulous because they often have ins with these other lenders uh, and access to rates that you might not have as, as a direct consumer going into the bank. Um, but just knowing that you do have options, that you should shop those options. Um, and even if you decide to go with your big bank at the end of the day, if you know that lender B will give you this rate, you can walk in and challenge their posted rate. They're not set in stone, and I don't think people realize that. Yeah. Um, and again, I think the, is being comfortable with your mortgage brokers, also really, or, or whoever your lender is, is, and ask them to stop when you don't understand something, which we're intimidated by. It's like, oh, well, you're speaking a different language, and I don't really understand it. But you've got to understand you're borrowing a lot of money. Yeah. So I think it's really important. You just mm -hmm. say, I don't get that. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I learned that I think a lot of people may not be aware of is when your mortgage term is up, you don't have to renew with the same lender that you went right. with first. You can shop around just like it's your first time. And again, try to find the best rate for you. So always keep that in mind. Don't just auto renew. Do your research before when the time is coming so you can find a good rate somewhere else or, or with the same place. <laughs> Um, so I want to talk about the Toronto real estate market, this is insane. Um, so what are your personal thoughts on Toronto's current real estate market? Is it still worth it to buy or should people, you know, wait it out? Lots of people are saying it's a bubble, it's a bubble, but they've been saying that for years. So what do you guys think? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> as someone who covers the Toronto real estate market and reads about it all day long, sometimes my personal thoughts center around a glass of wine. Um, <laughs> But uh, when people phrase it like, is it worth it to buy? Um, I think that distorts the reality for buyers somewhat. Um, so people need to not, unless you are specifically investing in real estate, if you're buying a home to dwell in, you can't think of it like the stock market. Um, you know, it's obviously it's nice to buy low and sell high and to make a, a nice return. Uh, but usually for most buyers, it is an investment with a long-term horizon. Uh, you've got five to ten years to realize a return. 
Um, the market might do all sorts of things while you're living in that dwelling, but if it makes financial sense for you to own that home, and if your lifestyle circumstances have dictated your choice, it's worth it to own a home. But that said, in the Toronto real estate market, uh, which is in kind of a weird place right now. Yeah. Um, so what we've seen happen recently, as you all know, the Ontario government introduced some new rules. Uh, they were targeted at foreign buyers as well as speculative buyers. Um, what we've seen happen, and the data, we're still waiting on that. We don't know definitively what is causing what to shift. Um, but it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So sellers got nervous that things might change because of the new rules. So they all put their homes up for sale and they changed the market. So all of this inventory flooded and buyers now have more choice. Uh, so as a result, um, in the space of a month, we are seeing, you know, you might have a bidding war with 10 offers and now you're seeing one to two. It's, it's very dependent on region, obviously, and home type. There are definitely still homes that are going for obscene amounts of money. Prices have not softened. It is not a buyer's market by any means. <laughs> but if you're working with a great agent who understands the market, is understanding your needs, there are some deals out there right now. There are anxious sellers. <coughs> um, so if, if you're savvy and, and you know what you're looking for, um, but that said, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know if this is going to go up or down. We could look to Vancouver. You know, we could look to the 80s, but it's, it's, Toronto is its own market and this is its own economic circumstance. I would just caution on the generalization of some of those comments. I mean, there are still bidding wars with 11 and 12 and 13 <coughs> offers. So For sure. I, I have yet, and even in the last little while, seen fewer than, like I, I haven't seen one or two in the downtown core and maybe that so just I would just caution I don't think the market has shifted as much as we're talking it has shifted the inventory wasn't massive and it didn't continue to increase it kind of was like a one-time blip so just I'm a little cautious about that because I'm still in the market doesn't feel at all soft to me right now. <laughs> and, so. and to add what you said the condo market has not at all changed um, we didn't see any blip there so if you're buying the downtown core and you're buying condo stock um, we saw the exact same upward trend there. Uh, I'll specify that some of the softening is regional in different parts of the GTA. Um, it's detached sellers that are the most nervous. Yeah. Um, in terms of housing like gentle density, yes. like you mentioned, like townhomes and whatnot, uh, we are still seeing some, some skyrocketing prices and very rampant um, competition. But there, we have seen a slight shift month over month, which the TREB data supports. Um, that in some types of housing, if you were a buyer trying to get into a detached house, now is a better time than it was in March. And just to touch on what the Pen Penelope said, you are making an investment. So if you are in a position to buy, then it is the right time. Um, when I started looking about eight years ago for my first home, and I bought about four years ago, I was waiting for that bubble to burst eight years ago. <laughs> and if I was, you know, if I didn't buy, I would still be waiting because, you know, it's just, is it going to happen? You know, there's so much talk. Some people, you know, everyone has a different opinion, but it's an investment. If you are in a position to buy now, then do it. You get your foot in the door, and um, again, it doesn't have to be your forever home. Yeah. And you're adding on what was being said. Like, um, like it makes financial sense for you to buy if it's a similar monthly cost. I mean, if the mortgage costs around the same as the rent, then it would make more sense to buy, build equity, get you put into the market, and maybe a few years down the road, you can take that equity and upsize, assuming that you have the income to do that. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that was you know, a big reason why I think we hesitated uh, when we first started was we thought the bubble was going to burst and it actually continued to get crazier. <laughs> and so we, you know, kind of just readjusted what we were looking for instead of a house, a detached house, we looked for a townhouse, made more sense for us financially. And, uh, and we decided, you know, it, it makes sense for us if the bubble burst, at least we know that um, we won't be, you know, SOL if, if the market tanks. And I think that's the key thing is you need to kind of do a bit of a stress test to see if something does happen, are you are you going to be okay, or is it going to be like you're going to have to sell that house at a loss? So just be be prepared, right? And I think just to touch on that, even if prices do go down a bit, as long as you're not selling, it's just a paper loss. So if you're holding that property, as you said, for five, ten, fifteen years, you're not in a position where you desperately need to sell. 
then you can fold it out and you know that will come back up. The Toronto market also appreciated 33% over the course of a year, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is crazy. Um, you know, and let's say you bought last year, you saw you know a fantastic return on on your purchase, and prices soften 15%. You have not taken a loss on your home. Uh, you know, it, it's the market is um, just beyond. <laughs> common sense at the moment. So, and we saw the same thing in Vancouver. You know, we saw after the foreign buyer tax was implemented there that there was a softening, um, and people have not taken a loss on the homes that they purchased two years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and prices have since recovered. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, uh, kind of wrapping up, I want to talk about co-owning. So, again, this isn't a, a, a new concept by any means. I remember actually. You know, I'm originally from Vancouver, so I'm used to crazy real estate markets. Um, but you know, I want to say back in like 2010 or 2011, um, when me and my husband, uh, you know, were dating it, but we we're thinking, you know, eventually we can buy a place together, and we're like, we'll never be able to afford anything in Vancouver unless maybe we buy something with my sister or with a friend. And we knew lots of other people doing that at the time in Vancouver. It was very common just because things were so expensive. And now I think it's, you know, kind of uh, becoming a little bit more trendy in Toronto. But I think a lot of people don't know what that means, especially me, what does it mean in terms of, you know, creating a contract and, you know, what if it gets messy, it can be kind of, it's an emotional purchase still, so I would love to first go to Leslie, what, what are your thoughts and what should people know and be aware of before jumping into something like that? Well, <clears throat> like most things, there's always a risk, right? So you guys have talked about it, you know, the bubble may burst, the don't treat it like the stock market, you know, buying property is a business transaction. Right? It's a business transaction that you can do on your own with your partner or with other people. And you set it up just like that. Mm -hmm. You have really good legal covenants. You make sure that you're really clear up front. And not everybody's a co-purchaser. I mean, I have friends who are like, absolutely not. I wouldn't want to have to discuss every little, like, they're not into the negotiation process, nor do they want to have to try and, like, rule their lives around other people's. Those people aren't going to co-buy. But there are people who say, you know, I really like the idea of community, I really like the idea of sharing space. And I'm not talking about like living together, like sharing your kitchen and your bathroom. I'm talking about buying real estate as an investment to increase your net worth. You live on the main floor, I live on the second floor, and someone else lives on the third floor. Mm -hmm. And you treat it like, you know, flats in a home in other parts of the world where I have the right to renovate my unit. The problem we get into is when that party wants to sell. And what I'm trying to do is create a, a, a market of people who say, I've got a young couple who don't want to live in a condo. They want to buy a flat in this house. And so trying to create it so that people can leave without having to disrupt the whole structure or having it in the legal covenant that you are responsible for landlording that unit. And so the revenue stream keeps. There's so many, I mean, it's like asking, you know, I don't know who should my husband be or who should my partner be or whatever. It's like I don't know. You've got to figure that out yourself. But there's like lots of there's lots of ways to do it. Uh, I'm working with three women right now who are looking at their life past 60, um, and they don't want to be dependent. They want to share their resources. They're going to get a you know a unit in the basement for a caregiver, so that they don't have to ever worry about nursing care. Like you can. It's so like, it's just yeah. what you think you need. Yeah, and so what would be the first step for someone? If someone wants to jump into that, where do they go? Do they go to a, a sales well, or Well, the best they... thing to do, no, well, the best thing to do is to find someone to talk to about it, okay. right? And that can be anyone in your, but to ask someone to ask you the hard questions, mm -hmm. the what if questions. And that's partly what I do in relationships to people, is to ask them what would happen if, and what would make them feel safe in order to move forward. Um, and it's really a process. Yeah. Um, so find out whether or not it makes sense to you by asking yourself some of those questions. And if you have a group of people, absolutely engage another party in, in that conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and then I always say, go find out what you can afford. Mm -hmm. And that really shapes a lot of it, right? I mean, these three women have homes to sell. They have a huge amount of equity. So that's going to change their reality when it comes to purchasing. But the three young university students who are looking at just having their inheritance, mm -hmm. they need to also look at what they can. So it, it really then ends up being what you can afford. And again, not putting yourself into a position where if you lost your job for a month, you'd be yeah. in big trouble. So. 
piece. That's cool. Um, Leslie and I were talking about this earlier, and yeah, co-ownership is not a new concept, um, but it is becoming more and more common, especially because of you know today's market and yeah, younger people wanting to buy, and this is a way to make that possible. So Meridian has introduced recently a family and friends mortgage where up to four people can be on title. And uh, as Leslie said, it's a way to pool your resources to achieve a common goal. Um, and one of the things we recommend is to get a solid legal contract. You're definitely going to rely on your, uh, your partners and your trusted partners, your realtor, your lawyer, your mortgage specialist, and the contract needs to outline everything from you know break, the breakdown of expenses um, to who's how what like what percent share what percent ownership each person has. What happens if the roof starts leaking or the you know one person wants to renovate? That's is that that person's you know they can just renovate and that's it, or does everyone need to contribute to that? Because it might only be benefiting one person at the time but it is also probably going to increase the value of your home, which is benefiting everybody. So these are all things that you need to, you know, you want to think about and make sure that you've talked about it and you have it in a legal contract. And then, yeah, one of the biggest things is your exit strategy. You know, you might not, you're all going to be in different positions in five years' time. So if one person wants to sell, if one person, you know, just wants to move out, these are things that you want to talk about beforehand so when they happen, you have an understanding and you know what those expectations are. Uh, I'd love to know, Jelani Penelope, is this something that you've ever, like you both are homeowners, would you ever consider co-owning? Is this ever something that you would try out or what are your personal thoughts on co-owning? I think as long as the paperwork is airtight, because uh, that's where my main concerns would lie, anything that helps people break into the market, if that's where they want their money to be and build equity is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in the instance of those young people who are buying together, maybe this is the launching point for them. They can build some equity five, ten years down the road. Maybe they'll have what they need to branch out and buy their buy their own homes. Um, so, is it for me personally? Um, it would depend on whether or not I'd have you know a wall separation, <laughs> um, and as long as the paperwork is in place. But I think it's a great creative way um, that people are adapting to this market. I have to be agree on that. Um, personally, it really depends on the person who going to be calling with. Yes, um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I'd rather be someone like, uh, someone who I've known for like more than like five, ten years. Mm -hmm. Someone who I know I'm going to get one for sure with. Um, and That's also, their money. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. And also ensuring that the um, legal documents are there as well, like what has been said. So, for example, if one of the other co owners defaulted on the mortgage, you will have, have that included in your legal documents saying that you won't be liable if they default on the mortgage. So to make sure that we are very sure that the property is protected. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for chatting with me. Um, before I let everyone, you know, mingle after this and get some more food and drinks, uh, where can everyone find you? I'm going to start with you, Jelani. Okay. Where can people find you? So you can find me on basegblog.com. You can also follow basegblog on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And you can also find me on Twitter as well, Jelani Smith. So the easiest place to probably find me is the Meridian Credit Union website under Mortgage Specialists. I do have my Twitter at Heather underscore O'Hare, and I am on LinkedIn as well. So you can find me at zucasa.com and my blog specifically at zucasa.com slash blog. <laughs> uh, you can also find us on Twitter at Zucasa, same for Facebook, and you can find me personally on Twitter at PJ14. You can call my landline <laughs> six four seven. <laughs> Woo! Now I'm all embarrassed. Yeah. Uh, you can go to gocosolutions.com. I have a website. <laughs> Yay! Uh, and I uh, also am at Royal the Page. I, I've got cards if you guys are interested in you know the old fashioned way of getting a hold of me. <laughs> Well, thank you again, and uh, before you all go, I know there is a contest at the Meridian booth, so make sure you go there, say hello to those lovely ladies over there, and make sure to enter, because I think you can win a $500 HomeSense gift card. So, thank you again, and let's give a round of applause for these wonderful panelists.
Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And hopefully next time you can join me in person for my next live event. Uh, and, and in order to find out when that next event will happen, you're going to have to get on my mailing list. JessicaMorehouse.com slash subscribe is where you could do that to find out first when my next events or webinars or anything exciting is happening. So make sure to get on that list. And a big thank you once again to this Millennial Money Meetup sponsor, Meridian Credit Union. I would not have been able to do this without your support. I really appreciate it. So make sure to check them out at meridiancu.ca for more information. Uh, again, make sure to also subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm going to be putting out a lot of great videos throughout the year and I don't want you to miss a thing. So make sure to subscribe and I will see you very soon.